Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Beneath the Surface, where we focus on social, Islamic and political issues. Joining us today on the show is Dr. Stephen Sizer, who is an author of two books on Christian Zionism. We'll be reviewing his second book, Zionist Christian Soldiers, and focusing on his second chapter, Israel and the Church, who are God's chosen people. Thank you very much for being with us. Pleasure. We uh, usually hear that the Jewish people are the chosen people, are God's chosen people. How true is this statement? Well, the concept of chosenness is found rooted in the Hebrew Scriptures in the sense that God chose uh, a group of people to be the means by which he would bring his light and purposes to the whole world. For example, that one of the prophets says of uh, the Jews, you are to be a light to the Gentiles, a light to the Gentiles. Um, and uh, the, the prophet uh, Abraham, uh, God said, uh, through your seed, all nations on earth will be blessed. And so there is this concept that the descendants of Abraham, uh, Isaac and Ishmael and their children, uh, were intended to be a blessing to the world. Uh, the giving of the law through Moses, the Ten Commandments, are the maker's instructions. You know, when you buy a car or you buy a television, you get a manual, and the manual tells you how to turn it on and how to make it work. Well, the Bible is like that. It's the maker's instructions. It's telling us how we should live. God created us, God designed us, and he knows how, how he designed us. And if we go back to the Bible, we'll work that out. So uh, the, God's purposes for the world were to be, were to be um, shared with the world through his chosen people. But the, what's gone wrong is that the, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures even, we see some of the Jewish people thinking they were more important, that they were special, or that they were superior to other races because of their chosenness. They'd seen chosenness as a badge or a title rather than a purpose. You're chosen for a purpose. But then okay. if we're to look back, sorry to interrupt, no. but if we're to look back at you know, the concept of chosen people, um, through the Abrahamic faiths, which is you know, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, we all kind of go back to Abraham himself. So how does that differ? Well, it differs from the, con the way it's used today by Zionists or by some Jewish people in that it's equated today with a race not with faith, meaning if you are Jewish, you're chosen. But that's not what the Bible says, because we find, again, in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the prophet Isaiah and in the book of Psalms especially, the, the emphasis that chosenness uh, was open to all who worship the one true God. In, uh, in the Psalms, the psalmist says, uh, I will record uh, Rahab and uh, Philistia, uh, Cush, um, and uh, it's, it lists the other nations and says this one was born in Zion, meaning it's as if they had Israeli citizenship on the basis of their faith, not their race. And um, the prophet Isaiah talks about the temple in Jerusalem being uh, a temple for all nations, a place of worship for all nations. And in the book of, uh, of uh, Esther, the story of Esther, um, Esther chapter 8 verse 17, um, after God had delivered his people from their enemies, uh, the enemies were, were the surrounding nations and they were afraid. And it says in Esther 8 verse 17, and, and many other nations became Jews. So Jewishness is not about race, it's not about physical descent to Abraham, it's about worship of the one true God. So by the time of Jesus, the majority of Jews were not descended from Abraham, but they were followers of God, they were, they were worshippers of God. But it's gone wrong whenever people have thought, I'm better than you because I'm chosen, I'm more important. And so when Jesus came, he said to his disciples, you are the light of the world, not 
the Jews, you Jews and Gentiles who believe, you are the light of the world. So he took the concept of what the Jews were meant to be and says the church is fulfilling that role, Jews and Gentiles. So chosen today, the word chosen in a Christian sense is never used of the Jewish people. It's always used of those who acknowledge Jesus and worship the one true God of any race. But it's chosen for a purpose, chosen to be a light, to bring people into a knowledge of God. So, we, so the chosen people in the Christian perspective is a person who is practicing the message yes. of yes. God and, yes. and, and living a, a good life, yes. where they're spreading light on humanity. Exactly. It's functional, not positional. You see, chosenness today is equated with status, with importance, with race. Uh, you know, the white race, or the Arab race, or the Jewish race. And we all like to think our race is superior. But that's not what God intends, because we are all equal. We're all created in the image of God. We're all, irrespective of our gender, our IQ, our upbringing, we are each precious and special in God's eyes. We are all chosen in that sense. Of course, but then um, when did this actual, you know, um, the chosen people kind of like change? Because when looking back at history, there's been many times where for example, um, the black race has been, you know, oppressed. Yes. Or then later on, we had the Jew, the Jews in, in um, Germany being oppressed, mm. and now it's mainly like the um, the Muslims who are kind of like being oppressed. So mm. that kind of like changes. But then there's always that superior race or um, group that feel that they, yes. you know, they have that power or that position mm. that makes them stronger. And, and I think it goes right back to uh, the beginning of time because it's linked to sin, it's linked to pride, it's linked to what we place our security in. Uh, if our security is in God, and our lives are consciously lived in His hands, dependent on Him, then He is our security. If that is not our security, what are we going to place it in? In wealth, in uh, position, in popularity? You know, in the secular world, uh, famous people are either uh, pop stars, footballers, actors, they're people who've, who are popular. Uh, important people are wealthy people, usually, who can afford to fly first class, who have um, drivers, who live in expensive properties. We think they must be important because of their wealth. If we place our security in these things, we will never be secure because we will never have enough. You, you know, you gain your first million and what do you do? You want your second million. You've sold 100,000 records, what do you want? You want to sell 200,000 records. We're never going to be uh, satisfied if our security is not in God. So we find all through the Bible um, references to people going astray. Um, in the prophet Ezekiel, when uh, God's people were being brought back out of um, Babylon. He says, when you get back to the land, share the land with the foreigners, i.e. share the inheritance with those you find living there. Be humble. Share it, but they didn't want to share it. Um, you know, at the time of Jesus, when Jesus began to speak in a way that challenged the religious leaders, they said, we have Abraham as our father meaning we are special, we don't need you. And Jesus said, if Abraham was your father, he would have, you would have acknowledged me. Uh, you are of your father the devil because you're trying to kill me. So he was very blunt in what he said to them. Yeah. Um, yes, you know, um, various races have thought that they were superior at different times. And uh, it, it was often equated with empire, with power. And, uh, you know, those are very... Um, um, weak or insufficient basis for uh, placing our security in. But then when looking back at time as well, this is, this is kind of like why we believe religion actually came, you know, was introduced to humanity because people were very material in the sense that they had to feel secure because they mm -hmm. didn't have that knowledge of God and they didn't have that connection with him. 
they felt that they need to, you know, um, have that position and have that wealth and, and not really think of the other. But mm. every religion, like if it was an Abrahamic faith or not, they all we all have the same message, which is to treat your neighbor or your friend better than you would want to be treated. So for like the fact that all religions say that, but the majority don't tend to go by it. Practice it. It's just um, a bit That's confusing the in a way. <laughs> that is the challenge. Um, and, and, but we can each make a difference in our own sphere of influence in the way that we of treat course. others. And that's our responsibility and not to worry about uh, trying to change a whole nation or a, a faith community. God calls us to, to live out our faith in our own world, in our own community, and that's our priority. Please explain to us the um, sand and the stars. Well, one of the um, promises God made to Abraham in, in Genesis, uh, God said, I will bless you, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Your descendants will be like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, which basically means you won't be able to count them. You know, you're going to have many descendants. And for Abraham, who was still uh, uh, without any children, that was a step of faith. You know, he hadn't got a family when God made that promise. But we look back now and see that through Isaac and Ishmael, uh, we're talking about billions, uh, which, you know, in, in, a, in a biblical sense, was too many to count. So, that, so the, you know, the promise was fulfilled. Um, the, the problem has been that people have tended to equate the stars or the sand with their own race as being the chosen one. And what, what, what uh, the Bible actually says is that uh, Jesus is chosen and those who acknowledge him become chosen as we discover our purpose, um, irrespective of our race or our gender or our upbringing. But then when we look at it like that, um, did the content of the chosen people, God's chosen people, come from the Bible or the Hebrew scriptures? It came initially from the Hebrew scriptures, but within the Christian tradition, in the Christian scriptures, whenever the word chosen is used, it's always inclusive. And what I tried to show from the Hebrew scriptures is that God had always intended his people to embrace those of other nations. So the idea of equating chosenness with a race is inconsistent with both the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures. But the Jews with respect thought they were chosen and others were not. And some within the Christian church have thought they were chosen and other races were not. The failure is to equate chosenness with a particular race. Of course, because to think that God would just um, choose a certain race, kind of like it would be really unfair because it's like, okay, you, you're, like, you're the one that created me to be, you know, a British Arab. Like, that's not my fault, it, you know? It, true. So it kind of like limits God's power in a does, way. It does, it does. And, and the tragedy is that that belief can negatively impact others. So we see, for example, in, um, in uh, the United States and uh, in Europe, as a result of slavery, and the exploitation of people on the basis of their race, they themselves came to accept it, that they were inferior, that they were uh, the children of Ham, for example, that they were uh, not as uh, blessed by God as other races. And you know, the good news of the Christian message is that it's not true, that we are all equal in the eyes of God, and that's why for example, in India, the, uh, you know, in India they have a caste system in Hinduism with the Brahmin and the different castes, the upper class, middle class, lower class. Right at the bottom are the Dalits, D-A-L-I-T-S, Dalits. Mm -hmm. And they are the people who clear the waste away from the, the roads. They clear the rubbish. They even clear out the human waste. They are you know, the bottom of the society. They're the slaves, you know, bonded slaves virtually. The surprising thing in India, that the Dalits are often the ones who become Christians. 
because the Christian missionaries who went to India cared for the poorest, cared for the lowest in society and they welcomed that message because it was a means of liberation from the enslavement to the Hindu caste system. So if you like the message of the Bible has a revolutionary impact often among the poorest because they see the, the message as good news. Of course and that's that you know message is also in the Holy Quran where we would you know say that every human is actually you know equal mm. especially in the eyes of God regardless yes. of and this is like when we go to Hajj for example this is where we actually practice it physically and mentally like we're all dressed in white nobody knows from you know the rich no. from the pauper like everyone's the same mm. but then sadly when people go back to their own um, community they forget mm. that aspect which is which kind of like tends to happen across the world Yes. But then when we're to focus on these um, aspects, and especially the sand and the stars, knowing that um, you know the sand and the stars cannot actually be counted, doesn't that just make it more clear that it's not just a certain group? Because the fact that you know God um, promised Abraham two different elements, like the stars, is, you know, mm. planets, and the sand is just like you know um, different material completely. Mm. Doesn't that show that it's more diverse and it's more um, you know, that it continues to go on. It does, it does. And, you know, even within uh, the Jewish community, th there's a, a wide range of uh, religious as well as secular opinion. And so you will find uh, religious Jews who recognize these truths as intrinsic to their faith, that we are equal in the eyes of God. And they very often are the ones who will dialogue with Muslims and Christians. And many secular Jews recognize that too. But you will also find some within the religious tradition, the Hasidic Jews, for example, and those who, who subscribe to a religious Zionism, who do believe that they are superior, that they uh, do have rights that the Palestinians do not enjoy, and they will exert those rights with their guns, as much as with their money and their power, in order to secure their superior status in the settlements, where they can have as much water as they like, uh, special roads which only they can use, um, uh, you know, plundering the resources, ignoring international law, they're doing it because they know they can get away with it. And so it's, it's a tragic example of where one racial group thinks that they are superior uh, when it's only leading to their own destruction. Do Christian Zionists also believe that the Jewish race are um, the chosen people? You probably would need to ask a number of Zionists for their answer to that question. My, my understanding is that um, most Zionists do believe that they are the chosen people. How they view other races will depend upon you know, their upbringing and their, their religious convictions as to whether they treat other races as equal or as inferior. But the reality is, in the occupied territories, they're not treating Palestinians as equals. Of course not. They're taking the land, they're taking the water, the raw materials, the resources, and depriving them uh, for the indigenous people who were there long before Israel existed. Yeah, because I was going to ask, like, um, is, it, is that why that, you know, um, Israel kind of like gets away with it? And you would find people in other nations actually sympathizing for Israel even though they're the ones that are oppressing and destructing the Palestinian lives, regardless of their yes, faith. Yes, I think it's, it's partly because the Zionists have created a narrative that hides what they're actually doing, because they major on the fact that they're a democracy, they major on the fact that the Arab nations are trying to destroy them, that uh, drive them into the sea, whatever, that they're the, the, the descendants of the Holocaust. You know, there are, there are narratives and truths that they will exploit to hide the fact that they are destroying Palestinian society, uh, that they are creating a new diaspora of Palestinians who are thrown off their land. So they use language, they use propaganda, they use the media to, uh, to present a view uh, that, is, um, that is not consistent with reality. But thankfully, because of social media, because of uh, increasing reliance on satellite TV away from the mainstream BBC, CNN, Fox and so on, more and more people, in, in certainly in Britain, are 
aware of what's happening in Palestine, what happened in Gaza during uh, the incursions by Israel. And you know, we have a memory and we're remembering these things. So I think Israel is losing uh, the PR war, if you like, and, uh, and sooner or later will have to change its actions uh, because the world is growing impatient with them. I hope they really do change their actions, but the thing is, the fact that they actually believe that they're chosen people and they can get away with it, that's a really big problem because it's not only the political agenda that they're no. using, they actually have belief that God is on their side. Yes, the Israelis believe that they are the chosen people, uh, or the Zionists believe they're the chosen people, and, uh, and they bring God into the, uh, into the picture. They believe God is on their side. Well, with the greatest of respect, my, my reading of the scriptures teaches me that God is not on the side of those who oppress. God is not on the side of those who abuse the poor or uh, steal land or uh, punish people because of their faith or their, their uh, identity. So ironically, I believe God will uh, discipline Zionists because they are taking his name in vain. Uh, and therefore, I fear more an exile from the land than a return to the land. If we hold the Hebrew prophet's message seriously, it was obey and you can stay, rebel and you're out. So uh, if that message is consistently applied today, then I fear another exile uh, of Israelis from Palestine, not uh, an ingathering, a final ingathering. They've still got a lot more to learn if they want to presume to believe God is on their side. That's true, but then um, with their actual belief and with what they're actually doing in Palestine today, um, with their like political agenda, like they'll just remove the Palestinians and then they'll be able to live peacefully afterwards and then hopefully, you know, um, and develop themselves spiritually with God and then everything would be fine after that. It's not going to happen because the Arab world isn't going to let them get away with it. Iran is not going to let them get away with it. And I don't believe God will either because uh, friends in the West who want to see a just and lasting peace, want to see reconciliation, uh, believe that the Palestinians have a legitimate right and claim to the land. And that momentum is gathering at the United Nations uh, and the European community, and it's not going to stop. Um, and God forbid, if Israel got away with, uh, with uh, expelling every last Palestinian from the occupied territories, the world is still going to hold them accountable for that. Of course, and, and I hope they actually do, and hopefully they wouldn't actually ever get to that limit. No. But um, do all Christian Zionists buy into the dispensationalism? and the distinction between Israel and the church? No, no. Only a proportion of Christian Zionists subscribe to the idea that God has two chosen peoples, Israel and the church. That's at the core of dispensationalism. It's a big, long word, uh, but it's, it just simply describes a, a particular theological view from the 19th century um, that God has two chosen peoples. And so the stars in the sky uh, uh, are the church and the sand and the seashore are Israel. And if you, if you hold at this view that God has two chosen peoples, you can take a pair of scissors to the Bible and cut pages out that refer to the church and pages that refer to Israel. Um, it's a false dichotomy because what we should do is see the Bible in three dimensions and we see that the, uh, the early writings are interpreted uh, by the more recent writings, the writings of the, uh, the prophets are, uh, are fulfilled in the writings of the apostles. And, uh, and we see in the teaching of Jesus the correct way to understand the promises God made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and so on. So the Christian Zion, uh, Zionists sorry, just believe that, you know, the only two good moral people in this whole entire world is the church and Israel itself. Even though the, um, Israel is actually doing everything against what Jesus you know, um, taught us to do. Some Zionists have so um, um, convinced themselves that they're in the right that they ignore the inconvenient truths of the reality of what's happening on the ground. They have a very naive or, uh, or, or distorted view. And frankly, 
and this isn't been meant to be a criticism of American citizens, but the majority of Americans have never left America. You know, they don't have a passport, um, and therefore their world is largely determined by what they watch on CNN, Fox News, and so on, which is heavily weighted toward a Zionist perspective. Um, you know, consistently Christian Zionists are, are using the Bible to justify an unjustifiable uh, political reality. And the more that we expose that reality, the less inclined they are to try and uh, justify it biblically. But then when they tend to justify, um, is it because that, you know, Israel, like I don't understand how they're justifying it because it's very obvious to what they're doing, even though Israel is very strong and powerful in giving the message they want that, you know, like um, the Arabs are oppressing them or they're not treating them well and of course using the Holocaust as, as you, know, uh, a, you know, a big message for them to, you know, do whatever they want and please. But then it's very obvious to what they're actually doing. So I don't understand how they, using the Bible, how they're just justifying it. Sadly, the Bible can be used or twisted to justify virtually anything if you take passages out of context. And in the Bible, you will find stories of um, a battles, of um, conflict, where, uh, where God's people had uh, either were victorious over their enemies or were defeated by their enemies. And so there are models, if you like, of that are used by Zionists to justify uh, their present policies. When you demonize a people, when you um, question their, their, their motives or their morality, uh, when you stigmatize them as anti-Semitic or inferior or, uh, or, or uh, pagan or whatever, it can very easily uh, justify behavior toward them that would, in the cold light of day, be seen for what it is, criminal. Uh, that, that, you know, this behavior is criminal. Uh, but in that warped, myopic worldview where we believe we are right and the rest are wrong and our security is based upon our strength and our, uh, our resolve to defeat our enemies, sadly, it's, it, it slips into um, uh, uh, cr you know, criminal behavior that uh, is unaccountable. We see that in um, the Islamic religion as well. Some people, just like ISIS and Al Qaeda, mm. take um, verses from the Quran, which, in it being in the Quran, is, is has a purpose because you know we'll be speaking about history, mm. and you know we learn from that action. But then they don't take the whole you know uh, message of the Quran and the Put holy prophets. Context. Yeah, because you know everything differs. Yes. But then just being a religious person, regardless if you're um, a practicing one or not, you know, if you're praying or if you're attending church, for example, the whole message of religion, the whole point of religion is to live peacefully and mm. of course not hurt anyone. So for if someone was to be, you know, labeled or, or accused of being anti Semitic they would have to kind of like look at the same time, okay, you know, I may be, I'm not going to be um, abusing the Jewish people or hurting mm. the Jewish people. At the same time, what the Israelis are doing, because it's not the Jews that are doing it, it's the Israelis themselves, yes. what they're doing to the um, Palestinians is wrong. And, mm. and that's a fact. Like, mm. you know, I'm not being, you know, I'm not attacking the Jewish religion or the no. Jewish people. I'm just not liking what the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians. Yes. Well, I go one stage further and begin to question whether we worship the same God, because if they are justifying their behavior on the basis of their understanding of the scripture, the Torah, the Hebrew prophets and so on, it's not, it's not in my name and it's not my God. It's not the one that I believe has revealed himself as a God of mercy who demands justice, who has compassion uh, and, uh, and, and longs for uh, us to be reconciled. Yeah, because the first like um, verse in the Quran is is stating that you know God is merciful and He's beneficial. So mm. for people to go against that, it's just like it's very surprising because it's yes. like you know just read the first verse and and you've got the whole point of religion. Mm. But then some people tend to um, overlook the 
what Israel is doing? And is it only because they're believed to be chosen people that they tend to actually do that? There is a sense in which if you have presuppositions that believe that, uh, uh, that uh, Israel is special, that God has preserved them, that they are protected, they are being blessed, and, and what they have achieved uh, in Israel in literally one or two generations is a sign of God's blessing. If you believe that, then yes, you turn a blind eye to the means by which it was achieved. And, uh, and that's really our responsibility to educate the world into uh, that there is more than one side, there is more than one perspective. And, uh, you know, for example, with Gaza, we hear a lot about uh, Hamas firing rockets out into Israel and this justifies Israel's retaliation. But people very rarely will go back and say, well, why is Gaza the way it is? Why is it surrounded? Why is it uh, an open prison? And where did those people come from in the first place? They were refugees. They had their land stolen from them in 48. Uh, they had their homes demolished. Uh, and, and Jews are living in the, the homes of Palestinians. They have grievances. They have rights. And, and to perpetuate uh, this prison mentality uh, is one that we should not be surprised that occasionally they retaliate by, uh, you know, with, with violence. Uh, but we've got to go back to causes, we've got to go back to uh, origins if we want to make sense of why Israel-Palestine is the way it is today. Of course. Um, you mentioned in chapter two in your book that um, the Old Testament and the New Testament can you just explain both of them a bit further for us? Well, the, we, the Christians talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament as two parts of the same testimony, the, the narrative, the will, the will of God, the testimony, a testament is a will, uh, his wish, his will, if you like. So the, there is a continuity between the promises and the fulfillment, between the predictions of the coming of the Messiah and the coming of Jesus to fulfill them. So we look to a continuity rather than a discontinuity. Um, but the Bible also talks, even the Hebrew scriptures, talk about a new covenant, that God made a covenant with his people through, uh, first of all, Adam, uh, uh, that, uh, and then with Noah, he wouldn't flood the world again. Uh, with, with Abraham, that he would bless the world through Abraham. He made a covenant with David that your descendant will be on the throne forever. Uh, you know, he made promises to his people through individuals. But the prophet Jeremiah talks about the day coming when God will institute a new covenant, not written uh, on, on stone like the Ten Commandments, but written in our hearts. Uh, a covenant that would be uh, that would be internalized and not external. Well, the New Testament talks about the new covenant uh, being fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, at the Last Supper, Jesus said, um, "Drink this wine, eat this bread. This is my body. This is my blood. Uh, these are symbols of what I'm about to do as the Passover lamb to be sacrificed for your sin." So the death of Jesus. Uh, was bound up with God instituting a new covenant so that our salvation would not be through good works, through trying hard, through um, observing, but our salvation would be achieved by Jesus in our place, that all would be required of us is to trust in him. So when he said this is the blood of the new covenant, he was pointing back to Jeremiah uh, and saying, we are instituting a new relationship with God, not on the basis of race, works, uh, religion, ethnicity. It's purely based on the basis of God's grace, his goodness, his love revealed in uh, and made possible through Jesus, his death and resurrection. So the New Testament is seen as the new covenant. And controversially, the New Testament says that the new covenant replaces the old one. So dispensationalists go wrong when they think there are two, like railway lines, that go on into the future together. It, no, it's more that the old covenant was, was fulfilled in the new covenant. There's a continuity through the cross, through the coming of Jesus, his life, his death and resurrection. So um, 
do people tend do the Zionists tend to use that differently? Yes, they like to believe that God has a continuing covenant through the Old Testament law, through circumcision, through the Torah, through Torah obedience uh, and observance with the Jewish people apart from the church. And this is not what the New Testament teaches. So with the um, Testaments that are available for um, the Christians and the Jews, do they tend to kind of, is that why also there's the church and the Israel? Mm. Like, is that why they believe that they're both the chosen people? Yes, yes. And that's why our role is to help them to see that that's not what the Bible says. That uh, God's people has always been one people. Uh, the New Testament talks about the vine and the branches. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, you remain in the vine and you'll bear fruit. If you go away from me, you'll be cut off. Uh, the other image you have in the New Testament is of the olive tree. And God says uh, the olive tree is made up of wild branches and natural branches. You know, you can graft in branches to the olive tree uh, if you want to make a new variety of olives. Um, and he says the natural branches were the Old Testament people. The wild branches are the recent converts, if you like, from the pagan world, the Gentiles. But he says the two have become one. And if it's become one, it can't remain two. So the emphasis in the New Testament is the inclusivity of God's people, not the racial distinction of God's people. When um, people classify themselves as chosen people, they don't only um, look at themselves as you know, uh, having a higher position and being superior to um, other people and other races, but do they also believe that they're the only ones that are going to be going to heaven, for example, and everybody else is going to be going to hell? Well, again, you need to ask them specifically what they think. Okay. But um, yes, that is the implication. Uh, within uh, some traditions of Judaism, the explanation of why there are Gentile nations is that they are the fuel for hell. That, you know, that we don't really have much role to play in the world. Um, sadly, even within certain churches, you have this uh, view that they are the chosen and other denominations are not. So you will find, um, uh, you know, uh, without naming names, certain denominations will think that they are chosen and the others are not. The Jehovah Witnesses teach it, uh, which is not a Christian tradition. The, the Catholic Church believed that only the Catholics will be saved and that uh, other denominations need to become Catholics. Um, some Baptist churches believe that only they are the true church. Um, it's no different, in a sense, to what we've been discussing earlier about Zionism. The idea that we can build a wall around ourselves, we are chosen, and everyone else is going astray. If we really believed that, then we would get out there and help people uh, understand that and welcome them back in, if we generally care for them. But then with the whole, you know, um, believing in God and believing that he is the most merciful and, you know, the, the kindest, like within Islam, we have more than one um, way in someone actually be going to heaven. Like, of course, the main one is, is actually being a practicing Muslim, but then you've also got a person who is very kind and generous. At the same time, you've got a person who has morals. Like, if you've got morals, you're going mm -hmm. to heaven um, regardless. Of course, there are different like um, levels in heaven, but then you'll still be going to heaven as long as, you know, you've, you've helped the people around you, because that's... Mm -hmm one of the main messages in Islam, to be kind of like um, putting a, you know, a checklist, for example, like you have to be a Jew or you have to be a certain type of Christian. Isn't that kind of like showing that God is very, um, it's quite racist mm. in a way, and it's limiting him and, and limiting his mercy? Mm. Yes, yes, very much so. The uh, whenever we go away from God's grace, we end up with other man-made criteria. And when people set the rules and write the criteria, they tend to exonerate themselves and condemn others. Um, the Christian message is that, that we cannot save ourselves. Only God can save us. And so we come to him like children, 
acknowledging our dependence on him and need of his mercy and his, his love and his grace. And therefore, if we are truly children of God, we will demonstrate those same qualities that are divine attributes. We will demonstrate them in the way we treat others because it reflects the way God has treated us. Which is very similar to Islam because, you mm. know, when, when people don't say you have to be of a certain sect or a certain belief, it kind of, this is why I kind of like understand why atheists, you know, are atheists because mm. when you would come about in that, you know, message, it kind of like, okay, I don't have that, those characteristics. What's the point of believing in a God? Mm. If he's just wanting these, you know, specific um, aspects or features in someone. Yes. I don't cover them, so there's no, no point. But then, like, how do they expect, if we're going to speak about a certain group, like um, the so-called chosen people, which are the Zionists, how are they going to expect others to join them if they're not, you know, giving that open door mm. and allowing others? Would they have to be Zionists themselves to yes. be a chosen person? Mm. Well, again, you need to ask them to get oh, okay. an accurate picture. But um, my understanding is that some Zionist groups are not particularly evangelistic. They're not interested in others joining them, that they actually like their, 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 own group. their discrete group. You know, it's like certain golf clubs or other groups in Britain. Um, your, 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 the status is linked to the popularity. And the smaller the group, the more prestigious one's position is. You know, there are some golf clubs where anyone can become a member. There are others where you have to pay a lot of money and you have to have certain status in society to become a member. It's exclusive. And that, in a sense, I think is what Zionism has done. It's created an exclusivity around race and around privilege that is uh, anathema to, uh, to God's uh, will for our world today. But, like, don't people tend to question this, like the believers themselves? Don't they question why God has just um, giving, given them that, you know, uh, status of, of being his people? Often these ideas about Zionism or Christian Zionism are taught by well-known preachers and pastors and, and people tend to pick up those views and accept them for themselves. We would call it a received faith. I teach and you believe because of what I've taught. And so they, in a sense, these people are mini versions of these television evangelists or pastors or preachers. But when they think for themselves, they will eventually figure out that what they're being taught is, uh, is not true. Uh, and that's why we produced the film With God on Our Side. It's why I wrote my book With God on Our Side, to help inoculate Christians from uh, the eccentric nature of Christian Zionism, to help them read the Bible for themselves, and realize that God's will for our world is so far apart from what Zionists teach. You mentioned in your book that um, Jesus broke down the wall of separation. Can you explain that further? Can you say that again? Um, you mentioned in your book that Jesus uh, broke down the wall of separation. Yes. Can you explain that to us further? Well, yes. In the, uh, in the Jewish tradition that had grown up by the first century, um, they had classified the world as Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles. Uh, the Jews were privileged, the Samaritans were half Jewish and half Gentile, and they were uh, rejected, and the Gentiles uh, could be tolerated. They could become Jews through circumcision and through obedience and, and, uh, and so on. Um, but they had created these walls, and so when you went into the temple, if you were Jewish, you could go in the inner court. If you were a Gentile, you would go in the outer court. So they were separated, like, like apartheid. Now, when Jesus um, died on the cross, it says the curtain temple tore in two, so that access to God was now possible, not through the high priest and sacrifice, but directly through Jesus. So Jesus has broken down the, the walls, if you like, the barrier between different races, between men and women, uh, you know, between different cultures, and, and, um, and we are all equal at the foot of the cross. So that's what it means. He's broken down the barriers. It's just tragic 
that Chris some Christians are rebuilding those walls and uh, believing that they are superior to the others. Thank you very much for being with us on the show. Pleasure. And thank you very much for watching. See you next time on Beneath the Surface.